as, as Kenny mentioned, uh, actually, it's Idigen. Idigen certainly, but it's okay. I, I'm, I'm the founder and CEO. I've been there for a bunch of years. Uh, but I, one common theme throughout my entire career has been, oops, there we go, uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks. In fact, when I started, it was an undergrad. I went to the Colorado School of Mines. I was in a, a, a mass spec lab, pyrolysis mass spec lab. And, and as an undergrad, I was an engineer in chemistry and computer science. I was using uh, neural networks to actually categorize really complex uh, samples. Um, uh, Pseudomonas and xanthomonas classification using pyrolysis mass spec as input. And, you know, you didn't think much of it, but <laughs> then I went off to Berkeley and I jumped into this world of protein folding and I tried to predict protein structure. We only had a couple hundred protein structures at that point, and now we get that each week. Um, and one of the most important themes you're gonna hear from me today is that content is everything. And if you don't have a lot of information, you're surely not gonna be able to train uh, these AI systems. But at that time we didn't have much information, so I had to reduce the problem down to sub-problems. And we were focusing on things like secondary structure prediction, disulfide bond formation, and touch on that a bit more, um, surface accessibility, and other things like that. Uh, you actually can see we actually had two neural networks at one point. That's actually the early deep learning. We didn't call it that, but that's what deep learning is when you have multiple neural networks together. Uh, I then joined a software company by the name of Molecular Design. Actually, I should show how many people have used AI in their, in their uh, work so far. Oh, oh, this is great. This is awesome. I have a ton of examples with Pikia. So while I, I can touch on some of these, in my supplementary slides, since I only have 15 minutes, um, take a look at those, because there's a bunch of references there and some pictures of some really cool stuff. But when I joined MDL, a software company, we, we, some of you might be familiar with this. It doesn't exist anymore, but this company focused on chemical information management. And I, as an early application scientist, was applying neural networks on the chemical structures in those databases to predict biological activity. And we were using, at that time, the MDL key set, which is the, the numerical representation of, of chemical structures, to facilitate rapid database searching. But I pushed the company to make those exposed. And that was like really tough, because a software company doing want to keep everything to themselves, and I'll come to that in a minute. I later joined Affimax, and we implemented a ton of infrastructure, because we put in research computing. They, believe it or not, they didn't have it. Some of you might know, I know Suresh knows of Affimax. Um, Affimax actually was the parent company of Affimetrics, and I'm sure many of you know Matt. Metrics. So Metrics spun out when I was there. Uh, but Matt Affimax did great common control chemistry work, but had no research computing. So imagine I came to a place that was all Macintoshes and we had to put in different infrastructure and then we put an AI on top of that. <laughs> oh, wow, amazing. People didn't even know it was there, but it was there and it was very helpful. Um, and then in 2003-ish or so, we established a, cert a company Certainty uh, and we've been using neural networks and a ton of AI, but also more importantly, the content that use, that's used to train these, and we actually license the databases uh, in that world. So that's about me, and I'd be happy to talk about any of these applications offline if you'd like, because we will have more time later. There we go. One of the things I want to touch on, though, um, and it's perhaps very relevant for you here in, in the PICIA community, open source in the software world, I believe, has truly changed the world. In the early days, we didn't really have much software at all to work with. I mean, I was doing my grad work with neural networks. I had to write all my own neural network code. I had to write my own scripting languages. I didn't have Python, you know? But now, all this stuff's available. And if you notice, I keep using the changer for your canoe. Uh, if you notice, after 2015, it's been an explosive growth. I should say that this is uh, the number of GitHub submissions. Uh, which is kind of cute. I actually asked ChatGPT to write the code for me to pull it out because I didn't want to write this code. Uh, but there's, oh, well now, well over 200,000 source code repositories in GitHub that you can just pull for free. And so everything we talk about today and, and thereafter, you don't need computer scientists working for you. You can hire a summer intern, put them on a laptop, 
and have them pull from GitHub and they will get you up and going really quickly. So uh, it's amazing how this has totally revolutionized the world. Uh, and and I, I, I'm frankly, I think it was 2017 that, that Google published their, their paper that, that really exploded things. Um, so let's talk about neural network. This is one type, it's called feed forward. It's actually at the heart of a lot of neural network technology. And th this, the fundamental point behind a neural network is a computational node. It's based on like a biological neuron in a sense. And it's a little decision maker. It takes a weighted sum of its inputs and it fires according to some threshold activation function. It's a nonlinear decision making entity. So when you start putting these in layers, you can start to create some really incredibly powerful tools. But in, at the end of the day, all neural networks are really doing is taking a series of input patterns and producing a series of output patterns. And it's your challenge to come up with problems to define uh, the, what those input patterns look like. So it's just a stream of numbers going in and a stream of numbers coming out. Now, a neural network can be trained to be uh, capable of doing just about anything that's represented in this way. The key, though, is to have a good quality data set of input-output examples, and ones that for a given input, it's a, a different output, uh, or uh, I should say the same input is, is, well, let's back up. When you provide an input and you stream it through and you get an output, you try to change the parameters in the neural network to produce what the output patterns should be. That's the process of training. It's a big aromatization procedure, but you can imagine it takes a lot of data, and as many links as you have in the neural network, you have weights. So those are the parameter sets that you have to deal with. Now, the data itself are either labeled or unlabeled. And this is fundamental for the concept of supervised versus unsupervised training. Most of the stuff that we do, I think, relevant for you, will be supervised learning where your data are labeled. There are examples where you don't label the data. Um, go a little bit offline on that one if you're interested. And then there are hybrid, where it's both labeled and unlabeled. Technically, the whole JetGPT world is this, the hybrid. So I'm going to turn to a quick example to show you what totally inspired me and how powerful these are. Uh, in 1986, Sijanowski published a paper on showing how a neural network could be taught to read a, text, a page of text aloud. No big deal today. We have Siri, we have Google. In fact, I don't know if you know, in your iOS 17, you can actually train it on your voice to have a personal voice now. Pretty amazing. But this neural network was new in it, it could take a stream of text and for the centered letter, in this is case it's a C, it was trained to produce how that C would be sounding in a phonetic sense. And the C, depending on the context, what preceded it and what followed it, could be forced, to, the neural network could be forced to produce the K of that C. So if you think about that, if you take a page of text and you train a neural network on, as you slide it through the text, how each letter is, is sounding as a function of what came before and what followed, so what? But once you have that neural network trained, and, and Sijnowski demonstrated this, you could run a whole new page of text that it never seen before, and it can produce an audible sounding the description of the text, and you would expect it to sound the way it did, and it, it, it actually performed quite well. This, to me, was just like the light bulb moment, because as soon as I saw that, I said, whoa, let's use this for protein folding. So the one example I touch on development for my work, we used amino acid sequences as input and tried to predict features or, or uh, something that might be relevant for those sequences as output. We actually were working on secondary structure prediction at first, figuring that the center of amino acid in, say, a window, uh, the residues that were preceding and the residues that would follow, would help decide if that residue was in a helix or a strand or a turn. 
We actually had great results, but were scooped by Sichnowski. They published a paper right about the time we were working on that. So we did a quick pivot and said, oh, let's work on something different. How about disulfide bond formation? Turns out we were able to come up with a neural network that could predict very strongly whether a centered amino acid cysteine, depending on what flanked it, if it was involved in the disulfide bond or not. That was pretty cool. And that was basically net talk in the context of protein folding, or in this case, a very key uh, feature of protein structures. I'm going to quickly turn to ChatGPT. I'm not going to go through all of this, no way. But the key, this is called the transformer. This is a, a, a fancy way of embedding the, the key blue feed forwards with different representations going in and out. And I don't know if you knew this, but all ChatGPT does, it's a sophisticated autocomplete. You give it a primer sequence. You give it a series of words as input, and it predicts what the next word would be in line, and it then feeds that next that whole sentence back in and predicts the next word, and it streams till it's done. That's pretty amazing if you think about it. In fact, the developers of, of this transformer model don't really understand how it works. They just know that they train a ton of data uh, train on a ton of data like all the texts that you see on the internet, all the wikis, all the different books out there, that if you give it a stream of, of initial text as input, initial set of words as input, it will predict an, another word that then when you fed in, it can come up with like a conscious thought. It's pretty cool. Well, that in itself is all I'm going to say about what ChatGPT does. But you can imagine that if you can do that, yeah, you, you can do a ton of different things, but keep in mind, the number of parameters these neural networks use is ginormous. ChatGPT4 has a trillion parameters that have to be trained on. So that's why if you're a stockholder of N NVIDIA, you've been doing well, because NVIDIA produces the GPU systems that, for the computer systems that, that need to be trained. But at the end of the day, compute power is not gonna be the limitation. It's going to be the content. We learned this years ago, and it's still true today. You can't tr train on Twitter because one percent of it is actually useful. You know, you can't train on data that's garbage. Garbage in is garbage out. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. So, if you have a massive infrastructure of a, of a neural network, you need to be able to have a large amount of data, or you reduce the, the infrastructure of the neural network down substantially. With respect to Pipia, that's why I'm here and that's why I'm already over, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I had examples of several of these in my supplemental slides, but I would, I'm going to just touch on one, the, uh, the uh, optimization of certain expression conditions, because this is just one of many. But you can imagine, from what just I've described so far, you could use these technologies, and many have already, uh, to optimize uh, sequences towards uh, certain desired expressions, uh, methanol utilization, you could use it for uh, summarizing documents and writing reports for you or the JetTP world. Uh, you can use it in the uh, bioreactor design process monitoring. I think some other talks are going to go into that. But so I want to turn to one example, it's kind of a competitive one. I'm not sure many people are working with the E. coli here. Uh, but in 2012, this group nicely published. Uh, the use of a neural network that optimized three parameters, temperature, pH, and the stir rate, uh, to try to maximize the production of uh, HCOMP, the human soluble catechol methyltransferase. Now, they used the CCD, the, the standard statistical methods, uh, to come up with a training set, basically. And this is, if you can't see in the back, this is predicted versus real. And the, and the predicted is what the neural network would produce. And they calibrated it on the set of data using your statistical sort of bracketing method. Uh, and they pulled some examples out that they didn't train on. That's what the validation set was. But once they trained the neural network, they pushed it to its limits to say, what could you extrapolate out? Let's try to maximize the h -comp activity. And that's what you see in the red over here. You got the neural network to extrapolate beyond what your st traditional statistical methods could do. So that, the E. coli folks did that in 2012. Not to be outdone, uh, the PICA folks jumped in, unfortunately, three years later, but 
they jumped in. A tougher problem because it's membrane bound now. Uh, but they, uh, in this case, optimized three different conditions, temperature, uh, DMSO, and, and methanol rate. And again, you use CCD, central composite design, uh, to basically build a data set to train on. But then they pushed it again, the limits, and you can see again, they were able to push to extrapolate even further. So something beyond what you might have normally done with your methods, a neural network could learn and extrapolate from the data. Um, and I think if you look, if you notice that number at 400, it's a little bit bigger than the previous, so I can pick you folks, BP, E. coli folks. The last example I want to show you is the one that's most exciting to me because it, it gets to the non-invasive uh, approaches to things. I'm a big data guy, I use neural networks for everything, I'm wearing wearables, I'm trying to capture all this information to maximize my sleep, I'm just all over that stuff. You know, I'm wearing GC, uh, continuous glucose monitor, all that stuff. But the reality is you can't uh, pull from a system without disturbing it unless you simply take a picture. This is an example of a group that used uh, non-stained, simple <coughs> pictures, the morphology, the shape of yeast, and trained the neural networks using actually a convolutional neural, neural network, but trained the neural networks to predict the level of ethanol. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. You look at a shape and you see what percentage of ethanol is in there. And I think this group was able to predict as far as 30 or 60 minutes in advance of what the ethanol production would be, just based on the shape. I don't think humans could do that. I certainly can't look at yeast and say, oh, this is, this is how much ethanol is there. But you can imagine if you have this capability, you could put this in a system where you're not disrupting the system, just taking pictures and letting it run until when you think it should be stopped. It's a pretty cool. Pretty cool concept. So, I sped through that and didn't go too much over. Um, I, I just want to lay this out here and hopefully during the um, question and answer or afterwards I'll hang around with the rest of the day. If you have certain problems in your space, in your world, that you want to make more efficient, you want to do things for less money, you want to uh, just succeed and you're having challenges with, if there's ways to represent your problem in terms of a data that are basically streams of numbers, input and output patterns, I'm fairly convinced you'll be able to leverage these devices. And as I showed before with open source, it's not gonna cost you a lot of money to do that because you could, like I said, hire a summer intern to do it for you. So um, with that, I don't know if you have time for questions, but I'd be happy to take one or two if you have them, or we can pop to the next speaker. It's up to you, Canute. So thank you for your time. Yeah, and so uh, the question is, can you improve beyond just simply using text, using the large language model concept? Can you use images, audio? It's called multimodal training, and yeah, the answer is yes. Um, uh, so one of the really cool areas is, um, it, it, it's involved, they call it diffusion, where you take an image, for example, and you noisy it up, and you train a neural network to take uh, the noised image and you force it to predict what is the clear image, and often does quite well. Now, if you add uh, additional information into that, like, well, that image is a, a cat or a dog or a, a sick cell, uh, you, you can start to um, leverage the imagery that's annotated. Now, if you have anything like even audible, uh, like sound like that it's making, that's a waveform. That can be represented numerically, and that can also be added in the equation. Uh, so you can go video, text, all those, and that's what you're starting to see. It's, it's pretty incredible. It's basically all the senses that we have as human beings, you can think of as inputs. And if they're represented into numerical representation, and you have a big enough data set, you can train a network.